Hello, everyone. Hello, Gabriel. How are you? Oh, and my hair. Ooh. And just like last week, I sat down to do this and I realized, oh, I haven't put any links up. So whoever shows up is whoever shows up. Um, been very busy again lately. So, but glad to be here. Um, yeah, just too bit. I think I bit off more than I could chew. The my my goal for the month of August was to have nine videos a week. Ooh, and um, and not just any video, right? Following my my little schedule. And yeah, that's just been wearing me out. So anyway, <clears throat> let's see if we have any questions. Now I did a video on the Behind the Wheel series. Now the Behind the Wheel series you can only access, well I shouldn't say only, that's not exclusive, but I mean, there are other ways, like if someone sends you a link, you can get to those videos. Um, but the behind the wheel videos are supposed to be um, on the blog. So I put out a behind the wheel video on Wednesday about answering somebody's question. And I'll make a formal one for that same subject later. But um, the question was, how about is it different being an adult beginner, knowing that you're not going to have decades and decades and decades to try to get this right, right? And um, I actually don't think it's that different. In my opinion, I really don't. And I'm not going to just repeat what I just said on that video. Um, but I really don't think it's that different. What I do think is different is how capable we are, I guess. I don't know. That might not be the right word. How easily we cope. Um, because I, I do think as adults, we sometimes cope with this stuff a little bit better. Um, and basically, what stuff am I talking about? Feeling like you're running out of time. Right? You know, when I felt the first time I felt like I was running out of time was when I was a senior in high school, <laughs> right? Little did I know. Um, and I felt that a whole bunch in my career. I, I don't think that, um, hello, Javier. Yes, I'm doing great. Good to see you. Um, you know, I, I, I think... And I said this in the video, I think what we need to do is focus more on the task at hand. This is, is unstable. Maybe I'm too far away. Let me move. Oh, no, it looks fine now. I just got a message that said my connection was unstable. Anyway, so I think that if we... If we focus more, when, when we're actually doing the work, focus more on getting these individual tasks done. I think it's better for our mental health. And, I, and that's true for everybody at every age. It's true for everybody. Because, you know, there's a, the same kind of problems that we have as... as and, and, you know... <laughs> Let me finish what I was saying. The same kind of problems we have as children, we have the same problems as adults. It just looks different, right? I remember that desperation that I had, thinking that if I don't reach certain goals by certain ages, um... I, I don't think it's that much different, right? Anyway, so I was going somewhere with that. Anyway, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to ask. Um, 
what was argument C? Gabriel says, I discovered when I play higher as I sit, uh, let's say on A over the staff, the front part of my neck forms cords. Do you think it's an issue I should solve? No, not typically. Um, stuff like that. You know, I remember doing a video, maybe it was one of these, and I, I was talking about uh, turning red, right? And it turns out, ever since I gave that video, I'm looking at my videos, and I turn more red than I ever thought I did, and I just never paid attention to that until someone brought it up in one of the videos. And... Um, no, I think stuff like that, as long as, so always keep your mind on the music, right? Don't think there's something wrong just because something looks different. Um, so there, there is some swelling that happens in the neck. Now, everyone's different, and everyone plays different, so they're, um, so it's going to be different for each person, but I don't, I don't believe unless something is um, drastically, well, and then the other thing is, is pain, right? If it hurts, then we want to look into that. But in terms of what it does to your playing, I don't like that kind of approach. I don't like the approach that says, hey, what the way you look is different, so we need to do something about that. I don't like that at all. I don't like to approach the physical stuff that way at all. The truth is we're all different. We're all very, very different. Uh, physically, we're all different. You know, I have one of, one of my earlier videos. I'm talking about... I think the title is, How Different Are We? And I map out just all the ways that trumpet players are different from each other. Right? We're different from where we started at. Right? Some people have piano and other musical experience before they start playing. Other people don't. And, and, and between those two extremes... We've got a whole bunch of different uh, possibilities, right, in terms of where we come from. I remember, for me, I had musical background, but only in my elementary school music class. So I had played a little bit of recorder, I had done a little singing, and I did music games and stuff like that. That was my music background, and my... Uh, my mom sang in choir, and my dad always had uh, jazz music on. Well, big band music, not jazz, but big band music. And, you know, I can't imagine that very many people in the world have exactly the same musical background as I do. So on the beginning side of it, we're different. On the far end side of it, we're, we're different. Where we want to go is actually different. That's another thing that a lot of people don't actually think about. What do we want to accomplish on the horn? That's always very different. Hello, Anthony. Happy Saturday to you, <laughs> I guess. We're getting ahead here. <laughs> so, yeah, we want... When, when it comes to physical stuff, you know what? One of the... One of the things that I saw, and, you know, I'm trying to stop interrupting myself. <laughs> That's one of the things I'm trying to fix in my videos right now. I'll start a sentence, not finish the sentence, and then start a different sentence. I'm trying to stop that. Um, so, anyway, and now that I've stopped and said that, I actually broke my rule. Um, so, we're talking about people playing different, right? Looking different. And one of the most validating things and most confirming things I ever saw 
because I've been teaching this about everyone being different for a long, long time, since the late 80s. And that's, by the way, part of the reason why I teach what I teach, because a, a lot of people will criticize my physical method because it doesn't tell you what to do. Well, I don't think it's right to tell you what to do with your mouth um, and, and all that stuff. I don't think I can, we can talk general concepts, but because everybody's different, that's, you know, that's, that's the reason why I have the, the, like the, the daily routine is set up the way it is because we're not looking for the right embouchure. We're looking for your best embouchure and my best embouchure. I hope that makes sense. So, um, when when we had here in Houston, the Summit Brass came. And these are some of the best classical brass players in the world. And when you saw the four trumpet players embouchures, and I'm not I'm not exaggerating. Okay, this isn't exactly what they were doing, but the kind of stuff they were doing, like there was a guy that had and I'm like I said, I'm not saying this is exactly what he was doing. But his, his embouchure, you know, was as weird as that. That's what I'm trying to say, you know, off to the side and, and, and kind of, you know. And to see such wonderful classical musicians playing with such distinctive individual looks and individual sounds, it was just very validating for me. So, yes, if, if stuff bulges out in your throat, that's okay unless it hurts. Anyway, um, Javier says, regardless of mouthpiece size, I used to play on a Shulky 24. I have always struggled to play F sharp under the staff. I see. Never had any problems with high notes, not even when I started playing the trumpet. Are you an upstream player? Sounds like you're upstream. And upstream are the guys that, that naturally, I had a, a student, so <laughs> let me back up. Upstream are the guys that play with the instrument naturally like that, okay? And that's a pretty exaggerated. I had a, a upstream student one time. Fortunately for him, he came to me for lessons before he started band. So I recognized that he was an upstream player from the very beginning, and he had exactly the same, so exactly the same problem as what you're having. And but his embouchure, there was like barely enough room for your finger between his mouthpiece and the nose. That's how far upstream he was, and he could, even in the in his best playing, he struggled with the nose below C. So that sounds like a uh, part of what's going on with you. So if you can clarify if that's if you are an upstream player or not. Oh, you do play upstream. Okay, so yeah, you know, um, there's stuff we can talk about. Um, but that's why it's happening. It's not. You know what I did with him? Because he wasn't a, a full-time player. He was just a... Uh, he's one of those overachievers, so he was, like, good at everything. He got Eagle Scout and and on the swim team and on the water polo team and stuff like that. So he didn't practice as much as a, as a serious student would. So I just made sure he didn't have music that went that low. With other players, and and you're right, it's not the mouthpiece. You have to you have to really for the low notes. You really have to find that angle. And I have a story I'm going to share with you guys when I get through some of these, because I had a discovery this week about something very much similar to that, very much related. Okay, um, <laughs> yeah, it's Friday. Um. ACAC AC says, I'm in school, but how can I get a more open tone? Sometimes my throat feels tense after playing. Uh, I've been practicing my breathing technique, though I just need other exercises. You know, 
I'm not into breathing exercises. I think a lot of that stuff really, what I'm into is air exercises. So I think a lot of that stuff has a tendency to set the balance off. We've been talking a lot about balance lately, right? I, I think if you do too much in one direction, it's like a big pendulum and you push and you push and push and everything else gets pushed out of out of balance, out of whack, right? And so I'm not a real b- big fan of breathing exercises. I think for one thing, just looking at it mentally, they get your mind focused on the wrong thing. We want to focus on the exhale. We don't want to focus on the inhale. If you get the exhale right, it will make the breathing right. That's how I see that. So, and as far as an open tone, um, the the I always tell people that if you want an open tone or any difference in your tone, it doesn't matter whether it's open or what. People say open, people say big, people, you know, uh, whatever change you want to make to your sound, you need to spend time listening to people who have that sound. And when I say spend time, I mean like more time than you practice. That's the most important thing when it comes to getting a better sound. And yes, I know that that makes it frustrating. Um, I know this because I've experienced it. (laughs) So this is only the second time we've gotten that on our... We've only ever gotten that one other time. And um, good thing Google, uh, YouTube has tools for that kind of stuff, huh? So anyway, that's what I recommend for doing, getting a better sound mostly is listening. The second thing I would say for getting a better sound or a different sound is to get this practice schedule right. If you're not resting, you won't get a good sound, period. If you're not resting enough, you won't get a better sound, okay? Yeah, I I was sure that person was about to do that because people on this, in our little community here, <laughs> people don't say stuff like hi, right? Anyway. Um, Gabriel says, thanks, Eddie, for the reply. Another question is about tonalization studies. I get confused on transposition. Is it better I buy the total files or go up on transposition? You don't transpose it, okay? You don't transpose it. There are instructions. So uh, where are you reading this? Are you reading these in the in the Daily Routines book, because the Daily Routines book doesn't have any instructions, so I should probably show you that on, uh, but there's no transposition. Let me grab a Daily Routines book real quick, because I should say this anyway. Okay, here's an old copy. What would be real nice on this Google thing, I mean, uh, the face YouTube thing, is to have a share screen like I do with lessons. Oh, Trumpet Trops Pro. Okay, well, Trumpet Trops Pro, it's the same thing. In the back of the book, well, let's look at that first. In the back of the book. There's an appendix, appendix for how to practice the tonalization studies. And it tells you, so let's go through these instructions real quick, okay? 
The first thing you want to do is change the, to the key signature on your head. We are, not, we are not transposing. Okay, we're not transposing. Change the key signature in your head. Then, start. Step two. Start on the cell. I call these cells. Do I call it a cell there? Okay, I call it, in this book, I call it a beamed grouping. <laughs> I guess because I didn't know if people would know what I meant if I said cell. Okay? So you don't play these notes. Don't start at the beginning. Start where the bottom note of this beamed group matches the bottom note of the scale. So in this case, this is what you're going to do in your head, right? In your head, you say, okay, that's the key signature. In this case, we're as an example, we're using three flats. And E flat is the bottom note in that scale. So we're going to start on E flat. Okay. Now in this one, we're starting on G because the bottom note is E flat. You see how that works? Whatever the bottom note is of that cell, that's where we're going to start. But we're starting at the beginning of the cell. Then you just play it up to, so let's let's go to the tonalization studies here. So whatever key you want to do, let's use a different example. Let's use um, A because A is a little bit unique because we, we I don't start A up here. I start A down here. Okay. So I'll start, I'll start here. First change of the key signature in your head to three sharps. Then we start here, and we play. Then the repeat. Oh, by the way, the repeat is not, we're not playing it twice. The repeat is for this purpose. If we're going to start here, then we're going to play here, and the repeat takes us to here, and then we play through. And then we end where we started. Okay, so if I do this, I'm going to start here. We're going to play it in three sharps. <laughs> That's not helping. <laughs> Now, the little notes are only for the sharp keys, okay? We don't play the little notes in the flat keys or in the key of C simply because there's no F sharp in that. Anyway, I hope that answers your question. The same approach applies to the tonalization studies in the other routine books, okay? All right. So, Anthony says, why is it harder to play low notes or oh, low long tones for say six bars and easier to play high D. So you're talking about how long how long you can play? It's because more air escapes. More air escapes on the lower notes. The aperture is bigger, the 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 oral cavity is bigger, even the, the tubing here in some senses, depending on, you know, like C to F sharp, the, the tubing here is is also, also bigger. I'm sorry. Um, okay, so that I hope that makes sense. So, yes, it's just because more air escapes. And you know what? There's There was a fad in the late 90s. I think it was the late 90s where... People were trying to, to do play more efficiently, and their definition of efficient was defined this way. How far can you play in one breath? And so they would demonstrate this on, on recordings and videos, and the way they made it so where they could play longer in one breath was like this. <laughs> They, they changed everything and made it smaller 
so that now you're getting this horrible choked off sound. And that's why in my in my um, chops books, I talk about never sacrifice because there's some of these we want to do for for um, all in one breath if we can, right? But we never want to sacrifice sound to do that. And here's the thing. True efficiency on the trumpet has nothing to do with making smaller aperture. True efficiency on the trumpet comes from playing in tune to the trumpet. Because when you play in tune, the horn resonates. And when the horn resonates, it becomes easier to play. You don't have to push so much air. You don't have to try so hard on, on the chops and all that stuff. Everything uh, you do on the horn, when you play resonantly, everything becomes easy. And that's where true efficiency on the trumpet comes from. If you're getting efficiency, and I know nobody said this, I'm just clarifying. If, if, if you hear anybody saying, oh, I'm going to play more efficient, and they, they, you know what it is? It's the opposite. It's, it's bad reasoning, right? Because people who do play more efficient, efficiently can play longer in one breath. That, that's where the error in reasoning is. Because just because people who play more efficiently can play longer in one breath does not mean that anyone who can play longer in one breath is playing efficient. Bad logic there, okay? I hope that makes sense. Richard says, hello, howdy. Nice to see you, Richard. Thanks for hanging out with us. And Gabriel says it's clear now. So, all right. So let me tell you guys about what I discovered this week. You know, I never really cared about the pedal tones. I do them. I don't never really cared about how good they are because, I mean, really, I can think of some gross analogies. I won't do that. Um Nobody's ever going to hear your pedal tones, right? So I never really cared how good they were. But my, my low C was always inconsistent. There are some days my low C, the pedal C, when you play it open, my pedal C sometimes would be more like almost operatic, right? And then other days it's like... <laughs> And I discovered this week, and it has to do with what we were talking about earlier. I discovered this week that for me, the days when it was not happening was days when I was trying to play straight on. Or, or not necessarily straight on, but too straight on, right? Because I know better than that already. You know, if you guys notice, when I'm playing normal, the horn is off to the left, my left, okay? Now, what I discovered is when I'm playing that low C, let me see if I can do that now. Okay, it's not coming out now. There it is. Okay, so that's that's one time that it actually sounds good. And what I'm doing to make it sound good is making sure that the horn is a little bit farther to the left than I normally play. And when I concentrate on that, that note locks right in. And I don't remember why we were talking about... Oh, we were talking about... Um, Javier was saying about getting those low notes. Um, we don't want unequal pressure on one lip or the other. And that, that I already knew about, right? We don't want more pressure on the top lip than we do on the bottom lip or vice versa. What I hadn't done before was, was trying to figure out 
a movement this way. I thought as long as I was pointed off to the side, that was just what I needed. But apparently, and what this reminds me of, well, anyway, I keep interrupting myself. <laughs> apparently, um, I have to move farther to the left for some notes and less far to the left for other notes. And this really reminds me of, uh, and I only read the book once. I don't have a copy myself. I would love to have a copy. I need to look and see, especially now that I just experienced this. It reminds me a lot of, um, what's that guy's name, the pivot system? Reinhardt. It reminded me of Reinhardt's book because, you know, when, when we're doing the pivot, we usually think this way, up and down, right? So pivot the horn up, pivot the horn down like that. Uh, Reinhardt's book talked about pivoting down to the left and up to the right and the other people's down, you know, um, different combinations of different angles like that depending on the person's embouchure. So when I discovered that the low C pops out for me down here like this, you know, it reminded me of Reinhardt. Now, other people have told me that my method is a lot like Reinhardt, so I really want to get that book. But I don't know that it's even for sale anymore. Anyway, thought I'd share that with you. Uh, Anthony says, upset. Got a tiny scratch on my third valve, slide valve, valve slide, inside part where it's brass. <laughs> Oh, man, I can relate to that. Blame my brother-in-law always leaving tiny pieces of food <laughs> crumbs on the table. <laughs> oh, man. I'm not laughing at you. I'm sorry. That's I can just understand exactly. A brand new Yamaha. Man, oh, man, oh, man. Yes, so, so Javier says, when he points the, the horn down, the low notes come out better. Yes, that's right. Um, Sparky says, uh, that's Doc Reinhardt. Um, Brad Good said on Reinhardt really, I said that Reinhardt really regretted calling the book The Pivot System. That makes sense that it was a lot, about a lot more than that. That's correct. That I, I only read it once, and when I read it, I was in Europe. <laughs> so it's not like I had time to really dig into it. Um, is it okay? This is from Javier. Um, is it okay to stick your tongue between the te teeth and lips to check the embouchure? So, I don't know what you mean by check the embouchure. You mean like when you're doing, like when you're setting and then sticking the, okay. I don't, you know what? That's the kind of thing that if it works for you, I would just do it. Unless, okay, here's the, the exception. Unless it's causing you to slow down. If it's like a security blanket thing, like you have to do this or you can't play, then I think that's a problem. Okay. I think that's a problem. If you can't play without doing that, like if you have to uh, do that every time you pick the horn up, that means like if you have a thing in a gig where you have to turn pages and then play, you're in trouble, right? Um, so I hope that helps. Gabriel says, can I please demonstrate how to do a mordant? So mordants and trills and all that kind of stuff, there are, you could make a whole career out of just studying mordants, <laughs> right? So I'm going to give you the watered down B flat version, okay? This is, all it is, is a single trill. Right? Now, there are different kinds of mordants. 
and generally speaking, we just do this kind. Um, and I don't remember. I used to know all this stuff. I don't remember what the slash means and stuff like that. Um, I used to know all of that, um, but I don't use it as much as I used to. So uh, that's. But anyway, here's what a mordant is. So. <laughs> So you're just going um, from the note to the next note up diatonically, unless the mordant says otherwise. So, for example, if you if you have a mordant in the key of B flat, starting on D. be uh, just a mordant. If the mordant has above it a sharp, or in this case it would be a natural, then you don't play E flat, you play E natural. Okay? So there are, but it's just, generally speaking, it's just one neighboring tone up from the, from the note that it's on. That's what a mordant is. It can be a lot more complicated than that. It has to do with, if you ever get that deep into it, it has to do with what era? Like what, you know, like, is it classical? Is it romantic? Oh, the ones on the Hummel. Okay. Yeah, let me look at that. Oh. I have a student doing the homework right now, so it's in my pile of stuff that's got to be filed. That's what I do. <laughs> it's, it's not a good habit. I pull stuff out for the students, and then I don't put it away. Um, I actually have three copies, three different versions of the homework. This is my favorite version, that's the Robert King. But I also have international music, and then this one from Europe. Oh wait, that's not Europe. I think it's Europe, maybe England. Spartan Press, yeah, it's a, from the UK. You can tell because of the, the page size. This is like A4, so this is a nice version too. Comes with a CD. I keep forgetting about that. Okay, anyway. So, I put my address on here when I was a kid. I, I for, for some reason, I thought people just lived the same house for the whole lives. And <laughs> so now I have this. I haven't lived there since 1982. <laughs> anyway, let's look at the mordants on here. Well, in this version, they actually write the mordants out for you. So let's look at this. So they actually spell the mordants out and then wrote the, the, the way it's supposed to be in the, the aside measure. So basically what I said, here's another... Okay, so that's another example. Anyway, I hope that helps. I don't remember if there were any more besides that. No, that's it, I think. So anyway, that's what the mordants are. You know, I, I played the Hummel and the Haydn in high school and college, and I eventually got sick of them to where I couldn't stand to listen to them anymore because that's part of the, doing a good job, learning the music is listening to it. 
I couldn't stand to listen to it anymore, either one of them, right? Couldn't stand to play it anymore, and I put it away for like 25 years. And then this student that wanted to play it, um, I pulled it out and went through it with her, and I thought, wow, this is a great concerto. <laughs> Sometimes you just need a break, like a really long break. <laughs> So Anthony, no, those aren't grace notes. A grace note would be as if you if you didn't have that first note. So I really wish I could share screen, right? So let's say this is a, a, a staff, okay? Let's say the note is here. You go from so a grace note will go tia, tia. A group more than goes daia, okay? Daia, 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 okay? I'm, a, I'm not singing very well today. So here's here's grace notes. Right? And here's a mordant. And here's a grace note. Okay, those that's are the difference between those two. Now, grace notes and mordants all fall in the category of uh, what you call it, um, embellishments, right? Embellishments. And here's what I'd say always about embellishments is that the embellishments should not, this is the opposite of jazz. In jazz, we call them effects, right? And if in jazz, you want to push more behind the embellishments, behind the effects. So like if you're doing... <laughs> Right? You want to push hard air behind that. Same thing with the fall. Right? You want to push air behind that. Um, for classical music, and I have a, 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 a picture frame that I like to use for this, um, but in classical music, the embellishments are called embellishments for a reason. They're not supposed to draw attention. They're they're like the they're like the engraving on the frame. They're not the picture. I hope that makes sense. Embellishments are supposed to be done almost like an afterthought. Well, well let, let me reword that. They're supposed to sound like an afterthought. And if you put too much emphasis on them, so um, it shouldn't be. You see what I'm saying? It should. There shouldn't be that much weight. The the weight on the note is about half of what the weight would be on a regular note, okay? Tony says, hello, Tony, nice to see you. Chops Express works perfectly with my 25% practice and 75% music. Yay, we like that. At my stage, I enjoy playing more. Wonderful. That's what we like to hear. That's what we like to hear. Um... You know, that's, <laughs> I'll never forget when I made the decision to move in this direction. I, I was looking forward to a career as a musician, right? And I thought to myself, I thought to myself, do I want to live like that? The trumpet was like a ball and chain. It was a, a burden. And I didn't want to live that way. I didn't want to live without that freedom, because, and, and that's part of what we're talking about, right? Why should I have to spend hours and hours a day playing exercises all day? And so yes, the, the, the Chops Express helps make that happen. You get most of the same benefit. Chops Express gives you most of the same benefit as the other routines because the exercises are done in that order.
which is where the benefit comes from. So as long as you're doing the exercises in that order, you're getting that benefit. So, yeah. So I'm glad to hear that. Javier says, yeah, Chops Express is a great book. Works perfectly with law school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's another aspect of that, right? So I had a student that wasn't, it was this week, this week, I had a student that wasn't practicing. And I said, well, why aren't you practicing? And yeah, and you know, I haven't been teaching him that long. And he says, well, he tries to do the routine, but it's just too much. He, and, and he can't, there's not enough time to get it all done. That kind of thing, right? With all the stuff that's going on in his life right now. And so I asked him what routine is he trying to do, and he's talking about the, cho the Chops Pro. Well, you shouldn't be, like, trying to only do the Chops Pro and, like, that or nothing, right? That's not how this system works. The system is scalable. You can, what I like to do, is take Chops Express on a day, let's say I, I have time to practice, but just not enough time to practice the whole thing, right? Well, then I'll do Chops Express and I'll beef it up with some other stuff. And so Chops Express usually takes about 15 minutes to complete, uh, sometimes less if it's a lower routine. And I'll just add more scales, more tonalization studies. I'll add um, a lyrical study to it and just beef it up like that to make it a little bit more uh, meaty than, than just the, the Chops Express by itself. <laughs> Anthony says, law school, hey, can I sue my brother-in-law about the scratch spouse? <laughs> <laughs> you guys are funny <laughs> all right any other questions so Sparky did you if you're still here did you have any hurricane trouble at all Okay, <laughs> Gabriel says, switchbacks is not as easy as it seems to be, <laughs> right? You know, trumpet switchbacks, I don't know if I told you this. I wrote that book. You know, I'm, I'm a Christian, and I'm not sure if I told you about this. I'm a Christian, and... Uh, there's things that other people enjoy that I don't enjoy, and it's not something. I, it's not like it's temptations that I that I keep away from. You know, I I don't even like certain things that other people like, right? So, um, and for I think it was five years, maybe maybe more than that, but ab about five years, I was playing. Uh, what do you call it? Um, New, New Year's Eve, five years I was playing New Year's Eve in Las Vegas. And because the guys just love going to Las Vegas, they would book the flights so that we were there like a whole week. And so I don't have anything to do at Las Vegas except eat. That's about the only thing that, that they have good there that I want is the eating. And so I spent uh, one year, I spent all my free time in Las Vegas uh, writing that book, that, that Switchbacks book. And I would sit in the hotel room with a laptop and just go, <laughs> next one. <laughs> so every time I see that book, it reminds me of that, <laughs> that trip with the hotel room and, and me sitting there with my computer. Now, I didn't finish it there, but all of the content was written out 
while I was there at, at the hotel. Oh, thank you, Javier. Javier says, I wish more people knew about these books and my system. Yeah. You know what? I appreciate that. I appreciate you feeling that way. Um, the way I see all that stuff is things happen at the time when they need to happen. Uh, I don't try to, I mean, I, I, it's not that I don't promote. I do some promoting. It's not a lot, but I do some promoting. Um, but we, you know, one of the things I tell people about my stuff is that my, my books, my music, everything that I do is for the people that like it, right? And yes, I want more people who do like it to have ex access to it. I really do. Um, but I'm, what am I trying to say? <laughs> I don't know. I do appreciate what you're saying. I hope it doesn't sound like I'm not, you know. I do appreciate that. But I, I'm not desperate for thousands and thousands of people to to use my method. If people want to use the method, I want it to be there for them. I hope that makes sense. Um, <laughs> Gabriel says... I tried the pro lessons and I had a bad delusion. <laughs> had to go back to Tyro. <laughs> now that happens a lot with my books too. I'll ask somebody, what is your range? They'll come into the lesson. What's your range? And now I know better, right? I don't assign them according to what they say the range is. We, we work our way up to it now, regardless of where they are. But um, I used to ask people, where is your range? And then assign them stuff out of the books according to what they thought their range is. And they can't get through half of the routine. And, um, you know, I had a, a, a student that went to a jazz camp and he took one of my books with him. And there was a famous trumpet teacher that worked with him. And the, the famous teachers looked at his books, wanted to see his books and pulled out my books, and the guy says, do you actually play that? <laughs> like, <laughs> and as if it was like a lot of material. It's not really a lot if you just pound through it, you know, but it, it, it does make you tired, so. Javier says, there are so many misconceptions. I had to to take a few trumpet lessons. Oh, he, he took a few trumpet lessons from different teachers, and there is a lot of dogma in trumpet playing. That is absolutely true. There is a lot of dogma. Um, and you know what? I think for the most part, dogma actually works for the best because most... And this is going to make me sound arrogant. I don't mean to come off that way. Um, when I say most, I'm talking about because everything in, in life has that, that whole skill level pyramid, right? There's a lot more people at the beginning end of the pyramid than there are virtuosos at the top. And the same exact thing is true for, for teaching, You've got these great, great, great teachers at the top, and then you have these thousands and thousands of people at the bottom who, they're, they're, they are still teachers, right? But they don't really know much about teaching. And then you have the different levels in between. And so I think in the case of someone who's, going to teach, but they don't really know what they're doing. The dogma is important. 
you know? I really do. I think, and, and, and so I, I think it's unreasonable to think that we should all be uh, Vincent Chickwitz. I think it's unreasonable to think that we should all be, um, uh, I'm thinking of some other great trumpet teachers, you know? I don't think we can all be that good at teaching. And, and I certainly don't put myself at the top, really. I mean, um, that wouldn't be right for me to say stuff like that anyway. But, that, uh, but being realistic about it, what I do is I learn from all these people, right? Like, for example, now Reinhardt's not here anymore, but Reinhardt would be one of those people that I say he's a great teacher. Um, so anyway, you can see that what... Right, you can see that on YouTube, the dogma. That's from Anthony. <laughs> Not you. <laughs> Present company accepted. <laughs> huh? No, I'm, I don't, you know, I don't see myself that way. And I don't know, maybe that's just an attitude thing. What I do know is that there's a lot of people who can't teach at all, you know? All right, so Gabriel says, I'm waiting to go with the flow. Oh, waiting for go with the flow. But it is not on Prime. On Amazon Italy, it will take more time, okay. Well, thanks. That is a good book. I, I go to, back to it every once in a while. I try not to play my own stuff very often, but sometimes I like to revisit some of those things. Anthony says, I took lessons from a pro who plays in Count Basie Orchestra, and he was a terrible teacher. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, teaching and playing, they don't go together. It's the, the two don't the, you just because you're a great player doesn't make you a, good, a great teacher. So anyway, looks like we're heading to the end of the hour. If you guys have any other questions real quick, um, we can squeeze one or two more in. Yeah, that's a good thing. Don't name any names. That's not what we're here about here. Unless you want to say good things. <laughs> I still live according to what my dad said. Um, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. Right? Except for, you know, it, it, it's okay to actually point out that this exists, though. I, I, I do believe that. Yeah, thank you, Gabriel. And you guys all have a great weekend, too. You're welcome. I'm, I'm happy to be here to do this. Now, there are some that we might have to uh, skip. We might skip one in September because I'll be doing some traveling. So anyway, well, good. God bless you guys. Um, thanks for hanging out, and we'll see you next time. Later.